All right, hello, willkommen, bienvenue, konnichiwa, ni hao jambo marhaba. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again, episode 219 on Sunday, the 13th of February, 2022. I'm Armish Phil. I'm Armish Ben. And I'm Armish Matt. And uh, we've got a special guest for you tonight. On the line, we have Masonic historian, archaeologist, author, Dr. David Harrison. How are you doing, David? Oh, else if I turn your <laughs> fader up, sorry. How are you doing, David? Very well, very well. Yeah. Yes. How are you? You all right? You good? Oh, yeah, not bad. It's been a hectic weekend, but this is my favourite part of the week, Sunday night, it's 8 o'clock. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I've been looking forward to this one, uh, to this one because um, it's such an interesting subject, Freemasonry, and uh, I'm into all sorts of esoteric subjects like sacred geometry, and, and I'm, I'm no expert in any of them, but I try and read widely ar- around these subjects, and Freemasonry is something that keeps coming up. And um, I, I suppose it started with Freemasonry a few years ago. I read a book called The Hiram Key by uh, oh, yeah. is it Robert Lomas. Yeah. Lomas yeah, and, and yeah. Knight. Christopher, is it Stephen Knight? Christopher Knight? Um, Robert Lomas and Christopher Knight. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I just found it completely fascinating. And um, I guess the problem is for someone like me, um, it's very hard to sort of judge. I mean, it's a really well written book, a really. Uh, interesting narrative it was obviously very well researched but you know as a lay person it's very hard for someone like me to sort of evaluate it and uh, and sort of weigh up against other things <clears throat> and it just raises these sort of questions about freemasonry how far it goes back you know how solid yeah, yeah. of a timeline do we have i mean what's what's your view how far do you think freemasonry goes back um well this is where it gets complicated because uh, Freemasonry works on uh, different levels, and there's there's different types of Freemasonry. So so um, I always say that the, um, the 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 truth is far better than the conspiracy theories, really. But in regards to the to the history of it, uh, we're looking at the uh, the 1500s and the um, what what we call speculative Freemasonry, which is what Freemasonry is today. <clears throat> is um, where it's more symbolic, so the teachings are more symbolic, um, as opposed to the operative Freemasons that, that built the cathedrals and the, the churches in the medieval period. Uh, they, they had lodges, so they, they kind of tour around wh- wherever the work was, you know, York or wherever, you know, um, down into Chester, wherever, you know, doing cathedrals, building cathedrals and churches, uh, and, and, and they form lodges. And by the time we get to the Tudor period, um, obviously, you know, there's a big political and religious change, and um, a lot of the cathedrals start to fall into disrepair, and, and uh, you know, they're not, they're not being managed as, as well as they were uh, building-wise. So um, these, these lodges, to survive... Um, started getting in speculative masons. That's their masons that weren't operative, you know, weren't builders. Um, and they were looking at the way, you mentioned sacred geometry before, um, they were looking at the teachings of sacred geometry. Because uh, if you walk into a cathedral today, it's fantastic. The fact that that was any cathedral, medieval cathedral was built at that time, you know, 800 years ago or whatever. 700 years ago, beautiful big cathedrals, you know, the geometry, the windows, um, everything about it, you know. Um, the stained um, glass, I believe the stained glass is like, we can't reproduce it today. We have no idea how they did it. Yeah, there's there's many different things, you know, uh, that these, these uh, operative masons did, you know, that, that, that defies... Um, the way we understand the medieval period, really, you know, they, they, they were highly skilled um, geometricians, really, you know, they, they, they could, uh, you know, they knew all about sacred geometry. And the thing is about geometry is that um, it was all seen as sacred, as sacred, it was all seen as divine. So um, today in Freemasonry, you know, we, we have these symbols, uh, you know, the, uh, the square and compass, for example, um all the different working tools many many different symbols and uh these ge- geometrical symbols 
if you like, um, even the uh, the equilateral triangle, um, that represents divinity. So, um, and obviously the the, uh, the equilateral triangles, the um, the the main recognisable one in in Christianity, you know, being part of the Trinity, you know. So, um, uh, you can see there how geometry represents God in a way. So this this is what it's all about. This is the the deeper esoteric. Uh, teachings of um, Freemasonry, um, and this is how it started. You know, 1500s. By the time we get to the 1600s, there's there's more evidence. There's evidence in England that that uh, people are joining, and uh, there's a guy called uh, Elias Ashmole. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of him. Nope. Elias Ashmole was uh, a royalist in the uh, English Civil War, and he he joined a lodge in Warrington, where I'm from, in 1646. Um, and there's a political dimension to that because he joined at the same time as a, uh, a parliamentarian. And even today, you're not allowed to talk about politics in, in lodges, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so there's many different levels to it, you know. Um, the teachings, the esoteric teachings, the, uh, the management of it, the, you know, just, just the whole essence of it, really. As far as, um, like, uh, you're talking about what one of the things that interests me is that we've got the um the speculative masonry starting in sort of after the the medieval period and then we have the operative masons who were building these amazing places like Chartres cathedral notre dame there's a few a few famous ones in france there's also um an alchemical element particularly with Chartres cathedral so is that so i'm wondering if there's something being transmitted from an earlier age that the free that the masons incorporated into their architecture. Um, yeah, I mean, if if you look at the history of architecture, <clears throat> excuse me, the the um, uh, going back to the Roman period, you know, I mean, there's um, there's uh, the way the way. Well, even before that, you know, uh, we can go back to the uh, the Greco-Roman period. You know, the Greeks and um, the temples that. Um, uh, they made in uh, in Greece, for example. You know, the Parthenon. You know, is probably the, uh, the the best example. They they have a certain kind of uh, dimension. You know, that, that they're using uh, the measurements, and um, uh, this is where we come back to the sacred uh, divine cubit, or, right. or, or, the, or the sacred measurement. The golden and, ratio um, is that the same thing? <clears throat> Sorry, the the golden ratio is that the same same deal? Yeah, I mean it's it's all very similar. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean it's all to do with like yeah the ratios, the uh, um, the um, uh, Euclid's uh, problem, you know, and and um, all all of this kind of stuff, you know. Uh, again, it's like mathematics, geometry, um, and this is all seen as sacred. So, and you can see it in the old temples the uh, you know that that sense of divinity in the old temples uh the parthenon is probably the you know the best known example uh in athens uh but i mean there's there's, there's many many more uh, and this also takes us back to solomon's temple and this this is really the um the linchpin if you like of uh, freemasonry the building of, of solomon's temple because you have that divine cubit uh that sacred measurement that was given by god to Solomon, and um, so basically, with Solomon's temple, you're looking at a slice of the universe. You know, the dimensions of it represent the universe. Uh, they are God's measurements, God's divine measurements, and so this is this is the essence of it as well. You know, um, hence the geometry and, and mathematics, and yeah, that might be a good way to. Uh talk about the, the sort of founding legend of Freemasonry, because you mentioned Solomon's Temple and this character, Hiram Abiff. And you, mm. and again, we've got the three, like you mentioned the th how important three is, the triangle and divinity. We have the three characters of Hiram Abiff, Hiram of Tyre and Solomon in take it, you know, sort of uh, coming together to, for this construction. So maybe that would be a good uh, sort of segue to tell us about this founding myth, legend, history, however you want to describe <clears> it. <throat> Well, the uh, the Hiram the Biff yeah. legend, yeah. Um, well, well, it is what it is. It is it, it's, it's just a Masonic legend, really. 
Um, and and this kind of appeared in the in the 1720s. Right. So f- relatively so, recently then. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So it's all recent, really. You know, in regards to uh, <clears throat> the uh, the historical kind of aspects of it. Um, but basically, yeah, the, that that is the essence of of what became known as the third degree. Um, and before that, there was only two degrees in Freemasonry. So you know, it was it, it was just apprentice and fellow craft, and that's it. And then this third degree appeared in the 1720s. You know, and and um, that that was actually what what my PhD was about. You know, just just looking at that, examining how these developed, these themes developed. You know, so. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all quite modern, yeah. And again, it's all wrapped up in natural philosophy, you know, which was big at the time. Um, I, Isaac Newton, for example, he, he was um, looking into um, Solomon's Temple, the uh, the dimensions of it. He was al- so, alchemist as well. <clears throat> yeah, he was, he was. I've got a frog in my throat, oh, so yeah, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be coughing all the way through this. And yeah. I'll just, a lot of I'll people... Just back end of the cold, but yeah. When they hear Isaac Newton, do they... they th- Think about the the apple falling from the tree, but they don't realise that he was he was very much involved in in esoteric research and a lot of these. Sort oh of yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. He had this um, other other dimension to him where he was um, spending a lot of time looking for the code, well, to crack the code of Solomon's temple, and and he actually designed his own temple. You know, he, there's there's a manuscript where he where he's got his own temple there and. Um, you know, he's researching the dimensions of it and uh, alchemy as well. Yeah, I mean, he was he was he was messing about with all, you know with all kinds of things really. Um, it's a bit of a polymath in that way, I would think. Yeah. It, it it raises interesting questions about because I'm I'm guessing these dimensions or this sacred measurement that this is derived from the Old Testament account, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, which, which goes you back, you know, at least probably 600 BC, at least, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Old Testament, um, it's all in there, really. You know, uh, again, you've got all these prophets. <clears throat> they were they were talking to God, you know, like Moses, um, um, Ishmael. Um, who else have you got? Um, Abraham. You know, um, Ezekiel. You know, all the all these people were were kind of in touch with God. You know, they they, they were speaking to God. So 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 God was basically feeding them information you know on 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 how to uh live live their lives basically you know so yeah yeah and and this is how this this divine measurement came across you know because god apparently told solomon the, the dimensions of his temple you know so it's yeah. just a shame i'm guessing archaeologically we there's nothing left is there since um well, it would have been the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, who, who sacked Solomon's temple. So there's very little left, probably apart from. Is there any sort of foundations or anything left, or so, you know, any any way of getting an idea of <clears throat> comparing the the biblical account with something tangible? Well, I mean, I mean, there's there's the Wailing Wall that's left there. You know, I think that that belongs to a, to a later. That, uh, that was uh, Herod's Herod's temple, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, but there are. Um, uh, some archaeological journals that that have uh, they've they've done digs on certain temples, Jewish temples at the time, and uh, the measurements all seem to be relative. You know, so so there's evidence there to suggest that that there was a certain um, measurement in the construction of these temples. You know, so um, that's that's an interesting little twist on it, really. I mean, I've I've heard people argue that these sort of ratios are incorporated in the Great Pyramid and the architecture of, of that building, which you know pretty predates Solomon's Temple by fifteen hundred years. And you know, I don't know if that's true. It's I've never been a, with my tape measure <clears throat> to, to verify it, but I don't know. Oh, yeah, you... yeah. I mean, well, yeah, it's a pyramid, so you know, it's 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 got uh, these these perfect dimensions to make it a pyramid. You know. Um, I mean, I mean, there are there are some some dodgy looking pyramids there as well. I mean, you, you know, there's there's a, there's a couple of hundred of these like dodgy looking pyramids that, that you know are a bit wonky. But yeah, the um, those, those particular pyramids that, that you're talking about, the uh, um, the Great Pyramid, 
the Great Pyramid, and yeah, they're they're just um, you know seems, perfect pyramids, really. You know, so seems to be a lot yeah. of of stuff going on with the Great Pyramid regarding uh, squaring of the circle and and ratio. Um, Randall Carlson, fam- on one of his famous lectures, says that it's sort of like a scale model of the norm- northern hemisphere. That the relationship between the width, the width, and the the height is the same as the equatorial width of the Earth and the distance between the North Pole and the equator, accounting for the twenty six mile bulge. That because it's not a perfect circle, the Earth. I mean, it's just wild. It's just really hard to. Verify these things, isn't mm. it? Just the four hundred thirty-two thousand. Oh yeah, well this, or... yeah, this sort of sacred number system, you know, with seventy-two mm. and four three two, and uh, twenty-six thousand. Oh, I can't remember what it is, but the the number of years in a processional cycle, the procession of the equinoxes. You know, people believe that these numbers are, are all encoded in this architecture, like the, the the pyramid and Solomon's Temple and whatnot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, this is where you get the sacred geometry from. You know, it's. Uh, um, I mean, there's been many, many studies of, of, of the Great Pyramid. You know, so it's. Uh, yeah, it's all it's all interesting stuff. You know, when you when you when you get into it, you know, it's it's uh, it's quite nice. You know, some of the uh, the things that you see. You know, you mentioned the, mm. sorry, you mentioned the uh, the cubit, like the sacred cubit. Mm. Is that something to do with the, the the elbow to the finger or something? Is it that measure? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what Newton was 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 trying to do. He was he, he was trying to uh, work out the dimensions, the you know the exact dimensions of this cubit. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to be coughing all the way through your show. So, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, well, yeah. Um, we'll edit it out. Yeah, that's that's what Newton was trying to do, and uh, h- hence he he designed his own. Um, his own Solomon's Temple, if you like, because he was trying to look at the uh, trying, trying to work out this this uh, particular cubit, and um, so Christopher Wren was also trying to do that. He was um, he, he he designed his own temple as well. So uh, and this is all written down. This is all you know, both the drawings of it and um, worked out their own kind of cubit, if you like. Uh, were they um, both uh, Freemasons as well? No, uh, Newton, Newton was never a Freemason. Um, oh. But there is a, a kind of connection because um, the guy uh, that was an early Grand Lodge member um, from 1717, uh, who supposedly, uh, well, is probably the, the main contender for constructing the third degree in Freemasonry, was a guy called Dr. Jean Theophilus Desagulier. And he, he was a disciple of Newton. He he actually loved Newton, you know. He was his hero. So um so there's a slight connection there, but but Newton was 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 never a Freemason. Uh Christopher Wren, <clears throat> uh, they reckon Wren was perhaps an early Freemason. There's there's an instance where he uh attended a ceremony um in St. Paul's Cathedral. Um so um it appears that he he actually, you know, kind of went through this early form of Freemasonry, um, and um, became a Freemason, but not a Freemason in the sense that we are today. So, you know, um, what what so much of, it's changed. What sort of what was it? What was the sort of difference between between that era and now? Um, well, I mean, that era was was like a pre Grand Lodge era. So, so now we're in a Grand Lodge era, if if you know what I mean. We have a um, Grand Lodge in England, the United Grand Lodge, it's called, um, and that's based in London. And they uh, they basically manage Freemason in in England. So in England and Wales, right? So it was it was more sort of fra- fragmented then, was it in the 18th yeah. century? There was there wasn't yeah. sort of this hierarchical. That's right. That's right. Now you've got organization. A hierarchical system. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, you, you know, now you've got Grand Lodge, you've got Provincial Grand Lodge, and then you've got all the other lodges that are scattered in that particular province. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's different now. Back in Christopher Wren's day and Elias Ashmole's day, there was none of that. It was it was more like a freewheeling kind of, 
you know, oh, let's set up a lodge tonight, lads, you know, that that kind of thing. It, it, it appears to be more like that, you know. Is that um, maybe because it was a bit of a, more of an underground movement? Was there elements of well, persecution yeah, happening yeah. at the time? Or um, what? Well, it, it wasn't much to do with the persecution of things, but it, it, it was more to do with the fact that um, it um, was a society that was linked to the operatives still at that particular point. Oh, right. Like, 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 like for example, when Elias Asmol joined the, the lodge in Warrington, um, there was one operative in that lodge, and we know he's an operative because he, he left the will, <laughs> and he was an operative Freemason. Uh, and he had his tools, you know, in the will. He was he was leaving the tools, <laughs> so uh, the working tools, you know. So, um, and and I did some research where <clears throat> he he was uh, part of a an operative Masonic community that was based in Lim, in Cheshire. It's a, it's a little village in in Cheshire, and um, so there were many Freemasons in in Lim at that particular time. This is the late 1600s, mid to late 1600s. So um, there was a community there, like an operative community, uh, which is interesting. So, and, and we know that because the, uh, they left wills, basically, um, and uh, they left the working tools, and that was their given occupation. Mm. So, so yeah, there's a crossover still going on at that time, at that point. I'm just trying to think, like, when the sort of cathedral building era ended... And I guess that's where it's sort Judah of period, stopped. really. Yeah, this is where it sort of dropped off, and there was less, <clears throat> less yeah. call, less need for uh, because it, I mean it was an explosion, wasn't it, of, of cathedral building across Europe? Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. The bigger the better. Yeah, I mean there was so much money pumped into the building of, of, of these cathedrals, and not just the building of them; it was the it was the maintenance of them. Mm. I mean, even today, you know, they cost millions to maintain. You know, they're always, you know, if, if you go into Chester Cathedral, for example, or wherever, Worcester, uh, Worcestershire Cathedral, Worcester Cathedral, Gloucester, they're always kind of, you know, uh, there's always a charity thing going up, like an upkeep of, of the cathedral. It costs millions to maintain. So it wasn't just the building of them, it, it was the main, uh, the maintenance of them. And as well, sometimes they were expanded, you know. So, um, uh, yeah, by the time we get to the Tudor period, um, you know, with the uh, um, uh, Henry VIII coming along and divorcing, you know, his his his, his first wife, um, and uh, suddenly, you know, England, well, Britain, slowly becomes Protestant country, and um, yeah, from 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 there on, you know, these 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 cathedrals are. Uh, you know, not maintained as well, you know. Um, and, and there's no new cathedral building until St. Paul's Cathedral with, with Christopher Wren in the uh, the later 1600s after the fire of London. Right. So I'm so, guessing, yeah, I'm guessing like the the turmoil of the Reformation and all this period must have yeah, had a, that's it. a huge impact. I'm guessing, because I mean, would, <clears throat> would some of the early cathedrals have been maybe 11th, 12th century maybe? Would they have been? I'm guessing they yeah. would have been Catholic then, Universal Church. Yeah, that's right. And then that's once right, you yeah. get into yeah. the 14th century, the yeah, that's the Reformation. Right. Yeah. That that must have just flipped things on its head, I guess. And well, yeah, I mean, I mean, there were abbeys as well. You know, there were all these abbeys, um, right. and um, these abbeys were suddenly the property of the king. You know, who who swiftly sold, sold them off for a bit of cash. Yeah. The best example near me is. Norton Priory, which is near Runcorn. Um, and that that was, um, as the name suggests, a priory. And uh, when you get to the Reformation, um, the, um, you know, the land gets uh, confiscated by the king. Um, all the, uh, the monks there, you know, the abbots have to leave. You know, they're gone, dismissed. Um, and the king sells, sell, sells the land to a, to a local family. And, um, you know, so, yeah. So you can see all these abbeys and, and priories that, that were maintained <clears throat> suddenly just kind of, you know, turned over. Yeah, and the dissolution Ramsat. of the monasteries. Yeah, yeah. 
That's right. So um, a lot of masons, operative masons, were out of a job. Really, you know, you know, there was nothing to do except maintain the odd church or whatever. You know, like Fred um, Fred Dibner. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's it. If you can climb a steeple, you got the job. Yeah. Well, rather yeah. than than me. Yeah. We have um, we have Saint. We're in Preston, and we have Saint Walberg's here, which is I think it's about four hundred feet. The steeple tallest is it? In the oh yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. The, it's the tallest parish church in the in the UK, <laughs> I think. Okay. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. so. And uh, Fred Dibner did some work on it famous, famously. Did he? Uh, yeah, not bef- Yeah, do you not remember the ladders going up? Wow. He had these uh, bright red ladders, and he had a set of ladders going right up to the top when he was doing mm-hmm. some work. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, he wrapped up and said, um, yeah, whoever wants me ladders, just go and get them. <laughs> 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 and they stayed there for years because yeah. he would, you know, he, he was just mad to watch the way he would... Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was he was right up. Yeah, he was all the way up. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. I mean, these these operative masons who were working on shots and Notre Dame and pl- and buildings like Walbo's. I mean, the mortality rate must have been pretty frightening working at those sort of heights with none of the you know health and safety. Oh yeah, stuff yeah, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they were well, well, they were high, highly skilled guys. You know, um, you know, they were they were guys that. Uh, you know, probably worked all the life on on one one building, on one cathedral, maybe, you know. Because mm. um, it, it would have been 30, 40 years work. Oh, yeah, some of them took so, generations, didn't they, to, yeah. to build? Yeah, so that's things. it, that's it. And the, and the sun's continued after them. And, yeah. and um, I mean, if you, look, if you look at Liverpool Cathedral, for example, um, which is a modern cathedral, the, the Anglican Cathedral, I think, I think that was started round about, I'm, I'm working off memory here, so around about 1900 or something, um, or somewhere around there. And it only really um, was complete in the 1950s. Wow. So that's that's a modern cathedral, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, um, it takes a long time, really. You know? So I guess there's no sort of operative masons still around. I mean, you... Oh yeah, the, oh yeah. Oh, all yeah. oh, right, yeah. okay. I went to uh, I went to York. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I went yeah, to York cool. a couple of years ago, yeah. and they had a little hut set up. Yes, outside and, the Minster. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's, yeah. A lodge. that's a lodge. Ah, yeah. right. Really? That's a lodge. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. they were asleep in there. That would be their lodge, and and in in that shelter, that lodge, they'd meet, they'd probably have a have a drink, you know, take it easy for a bit, you know, and then get back to work, and and that's where they dress the stone. You know, in the lodge, in the shelter there. They have a um, thing outside it, don't they, where they're chipping away at oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where they'd be chipping away to dress the stone to make it perfect. And we still use that in Freemasonry today. That that that's symbolic, obviously. When you first go into Freemasonry, the first degree, there's a, a rough stone, a rough ashlar, it's called. Yeah. Um and as you go through the degrees, it's more polished. Wow. So symbolically you've you've kind mm-hmm. of polished it off and learned how to dress the stone to make it perfect. So, and that all, that that reflects on on you. You know, you've you've it's quite perfected poetic, yourself. Isn't it? Oh yeah. So that, that's where the uh, the esotericism comes in, really. That esoteric meaning, that deeper meaning, because it works on different levels. You know, same as the alchemy. It's it's not about transmuting lead into gold. It's it's you you are the lead. <laughs> you you're you're trying lead. to transmute yourself into gold. You know, through yeah, your that's it. That's it. Perfection. Yeah, you're trying to make yourself more perfect because. Obviously, you're refining your skills, your own skills. We've all got individual skills um, that, that we need to refine more, you know, because it's a competitive world, you know. So you just refine those skills as you go along, you know, and, and um, so that's it. Yeah, that's it. So just ask about the sort of like that little lodge then and the lodges in general. Were they kind of started then for this kind of element of secrecy and trying to keep sort of like the method of dressing the stone <clears throat> secret and then sort of keeping it within masonry or whatever, essentially. Yeah, well, it, that that's all about their skills. Yeah, that's what you I mean. So back, in, back in those days, the medieval period, there was, there was the guild system mm-hmm. and uh, you'd be apprenticed for seven years. So you'd say, you know, you were a young lad, 12, 12 years of age or whatever, you know, um, you might be lucky to get apprenticed to um, a stonemason. Mm-hmm. And in those seven years, he'd teach you what to do, all the tricks of the trade. You'd mm-hmm. master that trade. Um, 
within seven years. But not within those seven years. It probably take you a lifetime, yeah. you know, to to get to his level, you know. Mm. But those seven years, you'd be apprenticed and you'd learn um, all those techniques. And uh, it's 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 the same with a tailor, um, you know, cutting suits, for example. You know, I have no idea how to how to how to cut a suit. You know, no, no. Um, I have no idea how to. You know, um, I'm I'm not a car mechanic. You know, I give me an engine. I haven't got a clue. But if you're trained in that job, mm. you know, so so that's so that's the mystery of of that particular trade. Mm. And this is where trades came in. You know, you you learn the mysteries, all the secrets of yeah. of that particular trade. Mm. So. Um, you know, it's like learning the guitar. We've done about music before. You know, it's like like learning the guitar or learning the bass or the drums. You know, it's a skill that you've got to learn. Yeah. You know, and um, and there's a there's a mystery in that. Mm. You know, and um, so you learn all the tricks of those of of that trade, and you know, so it's that's that's where the secrets come in, really. Yeah. Um, because you get you get these unskilled builders. Um, they were like jack of all trades. This is this is where the saying comes in, you know, jack of all trades. You know, you, um, you know, you, you you don't really know the full mystery of that particular trade, but you roughly can wing it, you know. Um, so there's people like that in the medieval period, you know, uh, rough builders mm. that that um, you know could uh, do something in in that respect. It's like it's like joinery, carpentry, you know. Yeah. I mean, fantastic skill. You know, uh, and then you you know in the olden days you'd be learning that for seven years, a seven year apprenticeship. Mm. You know, and so you'd learn the mysteries of of that of that particular trade. So so that's where the secret comes in, the mysteries of the craft. Yeah, and this goes back again to the foundation myth. Uh, in that, well, I'll, I'm not. I'll try and not relate it, but this Hiram Abiff, who's like the chief architect of Solomon's Temple, mm. it's a couple of ruffians. Three ruffians come up and say, "We want to know the secret of, mm-hmm. you know, what's what's this? What are the That's secrets it. for this? You know, being a master mason?" Mm. And he refuses mm. to tell yeah. them. It's like it's, it's like the lesson is there are no shortcuts. You, you got to yeah. work yeah. this That's out it. for yourself. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's he's murdered in the in the legend, and then the secret is lost. Uh, but, you know, yeah. may, maybe he told Solomon <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or Kate, or yeah. Harry of Tight. Who knows? But. Yeah, well, well, well. That's it. They were trying to take a shortcut from that yeah. seven-year apprenticeship. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's basically it. So, were there other so, um, societies associated with with other trades? Then I know, obviously, Mason. Oh yeah, a, yeah. There were there, there were other societies. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there was the Carbonari, um, <clears throat> who, who who were more to do with like you know the wood burners. Right. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of these this this particular group. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I had it for me too. <laughs> Yeah, the Carbonari. <laughs> well, they they became a revolutionary group in Italy yeah, and France right. um, in the 18th century and uh, the early 19th century. And um, Lord Byron became a member oh, of the Carbonari. Right. So there's many other kind of uh, groups like that, you know. Um, it's uh, yeah, there's a myriad of, of, of different societies. So I, I, wonder, I wonder what what's the difference between because I think uh, for me anyway like Freemasonry is the only one really that I've kind of heard of. How come Ooh. it kind of really took off? I guess and there's so many lodges because I know you know there's a lodge in Preston here where we live. There's loads in yeah. Blackpool where I work and sort of along the mm-hmm. Foul Coast. So and in America, uh, I mean it went yeah. massive in yeah. America. Didn't it? But, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, America's good, good market. Yeah. 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 <laughs> why did it kind of take off like that? Why is it so? Why has it got so popular? Or whatever. Um, well, I think we, I think with Freemasonry, it was um, it established itself as a grand lodge in right. 1717. That date, that date's debated now. It could be 1721, but I, I always go for the 1717 date. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, they organised themselves in a in a, a well professional structure really right. they they soon had provincial grand lodges which which covered the counties of england and wales so um very kind of uh, structured society um and uh, apart from that they, they started developing um other degrees like another further degree system so by the time we get to the uh, the 17 
30s, 40s, you get the Royal Arch, then you get the Knights Templar, then you get a myriad of other different degrees, higher degrees. Mm. Um, and apart from that, you get a structure that allows the aristocracy to um, embed themselves in Freemasonry. So the very top, mm. the Grand Lodge structure, you start getting um, aristocracy, not only aristocracy, but the monarchs as well, you know, um, all the sons of the monarchs, or, you know. So quite quite quickly, you get this established hierarchical system, um, and it and it lends itself to the, you know, to the uh, the status quo, I suppose, you know, in England and Wales, you know, the, the well, England mainly, you know, the the, uh, the class structure. So um, it, it it starts to kind of mirror English society throughout yeah. the eighteenth and nineteenth century. You know. Who's who's the current uh, grandmaster then? In England, yeah, yeah, uh, it's the Duke of Kent. He's mm -hmm. he's been in since I think nineteen sixty seven or something. So wow. he's been in a long time. You know, Michael. Um, now, now, if we look at Freemasonry in other countries, mm -hmm. um, in America, for example, it's it's roughly a Grand Lodge per state. And they ha they they elect their, their their grandmasters every year. Um, I think there's there's a couple of states, a couple of grand lodges that, that do it every two years or so. Um, but, All but right, so it's 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 an elected kind of office yeah. every year. So uh, that, so that it's more would... democratic. Sorry, you know. sorry to interrupt. That that mirrors like a, a worshipful master in your local lodge. It's something that you do for a year after an election. Yeah, yeah, that's right. In a in a in your ordinary lodge, if you like, yeah, um, yeah, they they kind of elect a, a worshipful master, yeah, every right. year. Uh, right. In some lodges, it's every six months, still. I mean, so I turn over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so you can see they need they need a lot of masons in there to to kind of, you know, do the do the system, you know, yeah. go around the system. Are they selective so, with um, admission to these societies? Oh, that's a good question. What what's the criteria? That's the criteria. Well, it's it's kind of changed a bit now. I mean, um, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a working class guy, you know, from you know, uh, from Warrington, you know, and and, and um, I went in in the '90s, the late '90s. Um, now, before me, before my time, you know, they were they were very particular who the, who they let in, you know. Um, so uh, it's always been more. I think from from the Victorian period, really the 1850s, it's been more of a middle class domain. So they always kind of looked at um, that middle class uh, social structure, if you like, for potential members. Um, by by the time you get to the 1980s and and the 1990s, the membership's going down like quite steadily, you know. Um, so, so they kind of started letting people like me in, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, but yeah, now you know, you know, it's it's very kind of, um, um, it's it's gone the right way in in respect to that, you know. I mean, I mean, there's all kinds of guys in there, you know, from different uh, class backgrounds, work backgrounds, if you like. Is it true you that um, that the only real criteria is that you have to have belief in a supreme being? Yeah. Yeah, that's it, really. Yeah. And so uh, it just got me just thinking that in God or yeah, a sorry, di a divinity, yeah, divine being. It just got me thinking that the way I've always heard it phrased, um, belief in a supreme supreme being, it sort of suggests monotheistic, in in the way it's you know, is that accurate? Is that fair? Um. Well, you've just got to got got to acknowledge a higher being, really. At one um, higher being. That's that's my point. It sort of it, it sort of suggests a monotheistic belief. Yeah. Just my wife not be as a higher being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, say you know, like you. Um, I do know um, a Wiccan that's in Freemason that's uh, joined, and he obviously worships a number of gods. You know, he, he's so yeah, you know, he's is um, but he he does recognise higher beings. You know, with an S on the end, I suppose. Right. But yeah. Um, that's that's one of the the main, uh, well, the the main uh, criteria, if you like, you know, 
And you, um, you need to have a sponsor as well, don't you? I think. I think you used to. I don't know what the I don't know what the deal is now. You you can apply online now. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, you can you can go go on the website and apply, and someone will get back to you, and that's it. So it's it's quite easy to get in now. You know, <clears throat> I mean, I, I I can remember in the eighties, seventies, um, when I when I was growing up, and and um, I mean. To be a Freemason, you know, you had to be a, you know, um, it, it was uh, the domain of the middle class, you know, you know, you, you know, he was either a police officer or he was yeah. a lawyer or a, a businessman or something like that, you know. One trouser um, leg rolled up. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's exactly. Right. That's where the saying comes from. Yeah, yeah, you know, when you, um, you know, when you get stopped by the police, you know, oh yeah, you know the sh- you know the handshake and the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was common it, that that filtered into the uh, the popular domain you know of uh, masons and uh, you know what what they were supposedly like you know i know there's a lot of charity work done by the masons um modern masons freemasonry a lot a lot of charity work does it exist for like anything else than that and a get together for you know like-minded folks i, I don't want to cheapen it but you know, I, you I really enjoyed it. scouts. Yeah, go on, like, go on, you might as well. <laughs> is it? Is it? <laughs> but I'm going to. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, is it? Is it more than just kind of scouts for for adults? <laughs> well, yeah. sc- scouts for adults. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's in in a way that's that is a fair point because uh, I mentioned before how it, how it works on different levels. Um, mm. I mean, I've I've been in 20, 24 <laughs> years now. You know. Uh, and I've certainly seen that that aspect of it because you get people going in there and the the that collect the the jewels you know like you wear jewels you know yeah. uh, when you've been through the chair when you've been worshipful master you get a, a master's past master's jewel uh, but there are other jewels and things like that and yeah. and there's different promotions you can get so there's different aprons you can get provincial apron you know provincial honors and things like that and um, so. Um, yeah, I've seen it. You know, people going in there, and that, and that's what they want. Yeah, because I, I was, I, I was in the boys' brigade as a kid, and um, uh, what, what mattered to, what mattered to us is, you know, as members of the boys' brigade, was that you know we got badges, got your badges, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we basically collected badges, you know, and then when, when there wasn't any more to collect, you got bored and left, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, but with Freemasonry, you know, the, the, there are people that are into that. You know, provincial aprons, provincial honours, grand lodge honours. You know, big aprons mixing with the big wigs. You know, um, you must get a handful of people going in with a perhaps skewed view of Freemasonry, uh, going in for the 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 blood drinking sacrifices, <laughs> <laughs> devil worship, <laughs> which what? is clearly uh, not not a thing. But you, how do you filter those sorts of people out in your um, in your kind of why are you looking at me? <laughs> Sorry. He's looking at you. He knows, he knows, he knows what you're going to say. Preempt him. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, um, the esoteric part, now this is where we come to the esoteric part. The um, This is where we look at the more deeper uh, aspects of Freemasonry, mm. uh, the symbolic aspects. And, and uh, you know, there are, there are Freemasons that are really into that, that look at the the deeper, more spiritual aspects of it. Um, now, the that stuff that you mentioned about the sacrifices and all this kind of stuff—I mean, that obviously doesn't happen. Yeah. It's it's main that that is the public view uh, yeah. of, of uh, you know th- this is what these QAnon guys think that Freemasons do, you know, and uh, um, <clears throat> this is um, part of the. Uh, the reason why some of these uh, Masonic Halls are being burnt and things, you know, in, in Canada and the United States and stuff, you know. Um, so people like that, you know, hate Freemasons anyway. So right. so, they, so, they, so they don't look to join, you know, no. they, they, no. they just look to... No, they use it as a, as a weapon against Freemasonry, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all kind of wrapped up in that kind of conspiracy stuff and... Yeah. and um, um, it's sadly quite quite a, a popular 
conception, really, mm. um, you know, of uh, Freemason. Really. And it's not as though uh, you, Freemasons are trying to, uh, you know, enhance that that view from outside. You guys open your lodges to to the public, and like I say, there's a lot of uh, charity work that's that's done. <laughs> Fantastic. Well. It, it still work. remains that yeah, it, yeah, it's not working. <clears throat> it's, 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 yeah. it's a natural. It's hard, I think, to, to 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 combat that stuff because it's so powerful. Mm. Um, it, it, I think recently, you know, because of the political situation of America and and us since well, past five or six years, you know, straying into politics now. You know, the, you know the Brexit stuff and the the Trump stuff and the um, the populism mm. uh, stuff and and the QAnon. Things and and uh, the way that people see Freemasonry as um, as being part of this kind of government conspiracy and and all this kind of stuff, um, it, it it is quite a strong um, image, mm. you know, and uh, it's going to be very very hard to shake, and you know, it's something that's 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 been going on for centuries as well because in the 18th century, you know the um, I, I've read a document where someone actually says, a, a Freemason says at the time that um, people think they were meeting on the full moon to do rituals and things, you know, witchcraft stuff, you know. Um, so it's a conception that's been going on for a long time, mm. really. Yeah, do you think, shape. this is, might be a bit left, <coughs> left field, but could mm. this conception of Freemasonry today be a hangover from... The persecution of the Knights Templars and Baphomet worship and all that sort of stuff. Um, no, not really. Because that, <laughs> that's like a modern. Again, it's a modern um, conception. The the, uh, the, uh, the Knights Templar. I think I think you mentioned this in one of your emails, didn't you? Um, you know, you, you you wanted to talk about the Knights Templar, but the um, they seem to be linked. That's all. And and like yeah, we no, mentioned, I mean, the book. there's no link. You see, that's that's the thing. When when the medieval Templars um, were ended, shall we say, and persecuted in thirteen fourteen, I think it was um, eighteen or seven. Yeah, um, the Grand Master was burnt in thirteen fourteen. Wasn't that's it? right. Yeah. yeah, and he famously cursed. Do my life. Yeah, he cursed them. So. Yeah, apparently so. Apparently, cursed, yeah, yeah. If he did curse, it would have been the king or something, or the or the pope or something. But yeah, the the um, I mean, that's when the temple has ended, really. You know, um, now the 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 Masonic temples, if you like, which is a higher degree, a side degree of uh, Freemasonry. Now that only emerged in the 1740s, 1750s. Mm. So. Um, that has nothing to do with the medieval Templars, apart from the fact that, that they just kind of created a ritual that was based on that, you know. So, and it was all to do with chivalry, really. It was, again, and Solomon's yeah. Temple. Um, so you're not buying that, because it was only really in France where the, where the Templars were rounded up. I mean, there's theories of, you know, Templar ships, making the way to Britain and then going to fight for Robert the Bruce <clears throat> up in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, there's no no evidence for that. There's there's never any evidence that's ever turned up for that. So there's no documentary evidence at, 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 at all, nothing at all. So, you know, there's no records. Um, and around that time, there's a lot of records right. for, you know, what was going on politically. Um, but there's no evidence to say that, you know, oh, a group of Knights Templars turned up to support Robert the Bruce. They were quite secretive, though, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, they weren't that secretive at the time. They, they weren't a secret order. You know, they they were... Uh, they were uh, massive. Order. They were yeah. massive, like the first banking corporation. Oh, yeah. Massive yeah. landowners. They were... They were that's right. Usually, that's, in, right. that's why yeah. they were persecuted, because the... <clears throat> Yeah, Philip yeah, owed them yeah. a lot of money. Yeah, he had a lot of money and a lot of land. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, but yeah, they weren't they weren't they weren't that secretive at all. And yeah. and all all the charges that were that were brought against the Templars was was just jumps up charges. And um, the um, Roman Catholic Church uh, basically 
apologised for all of that recently. All right. I can't remember they? the year, but they but they said you know oh yeah we're sorry yeah we're sorry about that. Seven hundred you know? years. Um, ago. So uh, I can't remember the year exactly when uh, they uh, they did that, but they. Uh, um, That's the start. Um, so yeah, it was basically quite a lot to apologise for. <laughs> Against against the uh, the Knights Templar order, you know. Um, so they wow. weren't that secret. If they were, they were just um, you know they were a monastic order, um, and um, yeah, nothing to do with. There's no connection at all with uh, Freemasonry. Um, you know, it just just doesn't connect. No. And the, I mean, they weren't the only chivalric order. What about uh, the Hospitallers? And uh, I mean. St. John's Ambulance is is yeah, directly yeah, yeah, yeah. traced I mean, back I mean, to the, host- the Knights of the Hospital. Many uh, religious orders like that, you know. Um, you know, the Knights of Malta and, and um, yeah, which again is another Masonic side degree. Right. There's no, but there's no connection, you know. Why, why did they just, use it then? Why did they use the Knights of Well, because of Malta? It's, it's the aspect of uh, chivalry. Right. And um, so you've got that moralistic code that fits into Freemasonry. And apart from that, you've got uh, the charity basis of it as well, um, and and the fact that um, <clears throat> these these monastic orders, these religious orders at the time, um, the majority of them went on crusade, so they were there in Jerusalem, um, where the uh, the Temple Mount is, which was the the site of Solomon's Temple, so. So there's there's this kind of loose connection that was brought in to to make the the rituals uh, the Masonic or the Masonic story um, stretch out a bit more. Yeah, it's very sort of rich, isn't it? And especially mm. when you start getting into this symbolism. This well, it's, 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 it's what I stated before. It's, there's many layers to it. Mm. You know, there's different layers to it. So these 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 conspiracy theorists. You know, um, that's nothing compared to the truth of it, really. You know, because um, really li- rich layers. You know, in the uh, the story, and there's all sorts of sort of offshoot organisations, isn't there? Like, and and there's like mm. the, the tell us about like the different rights, like the the, the, the Scottish right and the York right. Some go oh, yeah, to thirty three yeah, degrees, yeah. some are just three <clears> degrees. <throat> I mean, just, well, well, the Scottish right is probably the more popular one. That's 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 the one that's become embedded really in in Masonic culture, mainly in America. Uh, but elsewhere now, southern you know, Southern America, um, South America, and and um, in 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 Europe as well. You know, um, here we call it something different. You know, we call it the Rose Claw. Um But you can effectively go up to thirty three degrees, um, and and that stretches out the story. The, you know, there's more layers to the to the Masonic story. Uh, I mean, there's many many rights. Uh, Masonic rights throughout history. I mean, I mean you've got um, the writers in Endorf, you've got uh, the Elokoen, you've got the uh, the um, the right of seven degrees, you've got uh, Cagliostro's Egyptian right, uh, the right of strict observer. I, I can go on all night, you know. <laughs> so there's all these Masonic rights, you know, you know that, that that existed and have since been revived in you know in some respects. So there's all these different avenues that a Freemason can, can can go down. You know, the Illuminati, the Bavarian Illuminati is another Bavarian, one. Yeah. Um, oh, so yeah. you can basically go around all these different routes. The Royal Order of Scotland, the Operatives. Oh, there's there's, there's loads, you know. How many 33, 33rd degree Masons are there uh, around? I guess it's oh, there's quite a few, yeah. I mean, oh, if right. you go to the States... I mean, I've I've been to the states, you know, on, on book tours and things, and, and uh, yeah, I've met met many thirty three degree masons there. It's easier to get it over there than it is here. Right, typical. Um, <laughs> so you know, um, yeah, I've met quite a few over there. That's um, is that the pinnacle of Freemasonry though, that thirty third degree? Well, not not really, no, because there's many other things you, you can get involved in. You know, there's many other avenues you can take, you know. And again, this is where the different layers come in because you can sample other rituals, you can get other uh, promotions, you can get, you know, uh, become grandmaster of a, of, a, of a grand lodge over in the States or in Australia or in, in um, South America or wherever, you know. 
here, obviously, you've got to be either a royal or you've got to be uh, an aristocrat, really, right. to become grandmaster. Um, proper. It's proper over here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it reflects the society. Yeah. You see, the, 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 the particular form of Freemasonry <clears throat> reflects the society of that particular country. It, it seems odd that it was, um, there was, you know, the Masons went to many lengths to keep that secret and make sure there was no shortcuts. <laughs> so you can go over to America and become a 33, <laughs> third degree Mason in a month. or <laughs> Well, not, not a month. No, but, no, you know, no. But there's, yeah, there's yeah, different yeah. levels, isn't there, of, of, of achievement, I guess. What Would oh, a 33rd yeah, yeah. degree Mason from the UK, from England, sort of oh, yeah, look yeah. down on a 33rd degree yeah, Mason yeah, from America? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's different uh, kind of levels, though, isn't there, I guess? Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. That's it. It's all about levels. So It's all about... Uh, um, oh, hang on, there's something gone, gone oh, wrong. Sorry, yeah. I'll sort it. Camera. Hang on. Yeah. Mode for shooting movies. <laughs> you can check the angle of view before shooting. We're back. <clears throat> I've done that for a long while, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's unusual. So it's all this esoteric stuff you see. It is, yeah. Yes. Uh, hey, you mentioned the Illuminati there, the Bavarians. Yeah. Adam uh, Adam Weishaupt. Yeah. Uh, is there any links there, or is that more more myth and disinfo? No, no. Oh, he's. Um, no, oh, your camera's gone again. Just, just press so the button on top. On, sort it. Ben will sort it. Yeah, yeah. Just get Ben onto it. Yeah. yeah. Just press the button. Is he paid for this, Ben? Or what? <laughs> he... No, it's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> on the top there you go yes you got it right, good. you're back don't touch anything <laughs> yeah, just 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 sit down ben and don't move <laughs> there we go. so yeah, yeah the, um, the, the bavarian illuminati is that again just they're just borrowing hmm. the the sort of the the name yeah yeah well i mean the, the bavarian illuminati existed that that yeah. was a specific Masonic-esque right that existed in the 1770s and 1780s ended with the French Revolution. It kind of petered out. But the name, the Illuminati, kind of lived on, if you like. Um, and more recently, you know, that has been adopted again by conspiracy theorists. And, uh, I mean, it's just a great name, the Illuminati. Absolutely. The Illuminated, the illuminated one. ones, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. So, I mean, you can understand why they've pinched that and inserted that into their conspiracy stories, and it, it's fantastic. And and there are many Illuminati still, you know, still going who claim that name. You know, wow. um, I mean, there's one online. Bill Gates. <laughs> yeah, he might be in it. I don't know. But, um, there's one in Albania that I know of. Um, a Bavarian Illuminati yeah. in Albania. Um, there's yeah. I mean, you know, it, it they pop up. You know. The idea of like be, being illuminated though is is global as well. I mean, there's there's in Indian cultures you have the Bodhisattva, the illuminated ones, uh, That's probably right. ac across the globe as well. I mean, uh, everywhere there will be some kind of acknowledgement that there is a a pinnacle to reach to. I guess it's all about ambition. Yeah. Even you know, even in the Masons, especially it's, in the Masons. it's well, um, there's a a train of thought in Freemasonry that the Freemasonry has lost its way. Um, the more esoteric Freemasons think that at the end of uh, all these teachings, the very end goal of a Freemason should be to commune with God, you know, to, to actually um, experience cosmic consciousness and, and, and to become one with the divine. We know hence, a guy who might have a shortcut. <laughs> so, uh... hence going back to that, that, question about the when people join you know mm. do you believe in a supreme being so uh uh yeah you know there's so there's as i mentioned many different layers um but yeah you're right you're right with that the eastern philosophies you know that kind of thing there's there's a lot of occult revivalists in the 19th century and um, there were freemasons and um, probably one of the famous ones was uh alistair crowley you probably yeah, heard of Blavatsky him. Yeah. And all those guys. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and Crowley um, obviously developed what became known as the OTO um, 
some of you might be familiar with that, sex magic and stuff like that. And, and But he, he pinched a lot of stuff from Freemasonry and kind of merged it into his new order, you know, his, his OTO order. And um, um, so, yeah, it's kind of influenced many uh, in that respect, you know. And, and so there's various different channels that have gone down, you know. I mean, it's easy to see why, you know, the conspiracy theorists will... You mentioned, what was it, devil worshipping and stuff like yeah. that. Because mm. when you have figures like Crowley associated yeah. with Freemasonry and then started his own... Was it the, the Mizraim or something? Am I getting that? Some, is, Memphis some... Mizraim, yeah. Well, he he uh, joined Memphis Mizraim. Um, oh, he was already going, was it? And he joined? He joined right. it. That's, that's where he took most of his ideas from in, in relation to the, the LTO. He, he basically... Well, not all the ideas, but a lot of the ideas kind of got taken from that and put in his own little um, formula. Right. And um, yeah, so uh, but Crow- Crowley wasn't really well. Well, he wasn't a devil worshiper. He, he, he was a magician. You know, he was um, a guy that that uh, got heavily involved in magic, uh, sex magic as well. Um. And kind of forged a career from it, really, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he dabbled in, in many different kind of magical experiences, you know, magic kind of um, pathways, shall we say. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, he wasn't there, you know. So is, is there no sort of magical element to, <clears throat> to modern Freemasonry? Paul Daniels might have been a Freemason. <laughs> Paul Daniels? <laughs> Yeah, was he? Yeah. Is he? Is he still alive? Paul? No, he's not. No, he's he's no. gone. R.I.P. Yeah. <laughs> Old Daniels. He was he was he was great in the nineteen seventies. He was he was he was like one of, you you turned on your TV in the nineteen seventies. Paul Daniels was always on, just like that. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. Uh, Tommy Cooper. Eh? That's Tommy Cooper. That he's going to mix up. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you'll oh no, you'll like this. Not a lot. That's Paul Daniels. That was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's Paul Daniels. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, what was the original question you, you sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going to Paul Daniels trip there yeah. sorry yeah. it's fine, it's yeah. fine. We've, we've blown over an hour already David we haven't even talked about your books am I, am I, am I getting paid for this <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Yeah. I was uh, I was looking I did a, a live stream last night just doing my prep I like yeah. uh, doing the uh, show notes and stuff I went on your website and this like epic hollywood trailer came on for your for your book oh yeah 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 uh yeah. check it out i mean the the website if you, you watch it, your show with that i should yeah. have done yeah but yeah, yeah if not just go to the website it's on the screen or in the show notes so i mean what what you're working on at the minute are you have you got a, a new book coming out or are you writing researching what you're on with well uh i've just had a book out uh in november uh called the right of seven degrees which is what i mentioned before about one of these more esoteric Masonic rites of the 18th century. Ooh. And that's, that's doing re- really well at the moment. Uh, that's with Lewis Masonic. And uh, that's basically delving into the history of, of this particular rite, the guy that was behind it. <clears throat> and for the first time, it actually um, gives the ritual. Oh, in right. The so it's Is that allowed? Tra- <laughs> translated from, from the French. Oh, right. From and the you- 18th century French. So, um, yeah, it's allowed because it's, it's effectively a dead rite. Uh-huh. So, um, but it's a it's a very esoteric rite. It's got a lot of stuff in there about the Knights Templars, um, all all manner of things. That you know, it's great. Cool. It's a fantastic. Cool. Yeah. And are, are your books like are they fairly um, accessible to someone like me who's who's oh, yeah. not yeah. not yeah. in I mean, the game? I mean, I mean, they're done in an academic way uh, because I want to present the facts. I only present um, you know the evidence really. You know, so they've got footnotes. You know, um, it's done in like a in like a kind of soft academic mm. style, really. So you can read it, um, but if you want to look further, the evidence is in the footnotes, and you can just take off on your own little research. Then you know, um, so yeah, yeah, it's very kind of uh, approachable. Um, but I've done many many books really uh, over the past like fifteen years or so. Um, one, my favourite book that I wrote, because um, normally as a writer, you, you don't like your books, you know, because you, when you when you read them, if you if you do ever start reading your books, you always see all these little mistakes, yeah. and oh no, you know, um, 
So writers don't really like the books, but there is one book that uh, is my personal favourite, and that's a book called The Liverpool Masonic Rebellion and the Wigan Grand Lodge while we're in Lancashire. Yeah, right. yeah love Wigan Lancashire. had its own Grand Lodge in the 19th century. Um, they, they split from the United Grand Lodge of England and formed their own Grand Lodge, and it ended up in Wigan. And uh, <clears throat> it, it was only in 1913 that, that, that they kind of called it a day. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a great book. I, I really enjoyed researching that book because uh, it was very local. And um, the research to it was I, w- I was meeting people in pubs and things, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, that had documents and stuff smart, like this. Smart and, kind of research. Yeah, that oh, like... it, was great. it was great, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, go on the the website, which you know. Um, yeah, it's on the screen now for the uh, for the viewers, and we'll put it in the show yeah. notes as well for for the listeners. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah, and um, there's there's links there to, to where you can get my books. They're all, they're all on Amazon. On Amazon, so, uh, great. We'll put your author page in the show notes or something. Yeah. In, in the website. Yeah. One thing I, I, that's just just sprung to mind to ask you is. Um, when you're when you're researching, because the the quite specialised book, like, books, like you mentioned, that one about the the Wigan Revolt, if you like the, yeah. the new Grand Lodge. Yeah. I mean, as a as a, a member, do you does Freemasonry have like um, a, a library or an archive? Yeah, That's, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And um, is that accessible? A archive library in in the United Grand Lodge in London. Um, but do you have to be a member to to get access? No, not really, no. No, it's all open to the public. You can get a, you know, oh. phone up, whatever, shoot an email, go in. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they have archives that they've maintained over the, you know, hundred decades and centuries that are sort of separate from, you know, have the British Museum or other archives, sort of independently. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, oh. well, they did have an element of secrecy um, up until recently, really. I mean, probably the 80s, 90s, you know, so... Um, but now you know the doors are open. It's it's public access. It's uh, you know it's good. Uh, a, a lot of the provincial grand lodges have also got libraries. They're they're a bit more harder to get into, right? Right. Uh, from from past experience. But um, but yeah yeah, you can still still get in there and check them out. You know. Um, cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Right. Well, we'll let you go, David. It's been fascinating. I've really yeah. enjoyed this one. Yeah, so, it's a so good one of my. Favorite esoteric sort of subjects, side su- side quests, <laughs> side exactly. subjects to learn about. So uh, it's been mm. fab. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll it's let been, you go. The stem yeah, yeah. to be on. Yeah, oh, you're you're more than welcome. It's it was nice to meet you and uh, say hi to Robbie next time you see him. <laughs> yeah, come on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was going to say it's a bit like um, out out of the blank, but with Lancashire accents. So. Yeah. <laughs> out at <Good>. blank. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, David, yeah. stay on the line for us while we play ourselves out for one minute, and um, we'll catch the rest of you on the flip side for part two once we've had a, a short interval. Yep. All right, smash him. Thank you. See you soon. Ta-ra. <laughs> <laughs>